pleased and, and privileged today um, to, to have with us and to be able to present uh, the premiere of, uh, of a short documentary uh, film created locally here, uh, Hidden Homeless, Edmonton's Invisible Crisis. And uh, I, I can't do it uh, as much justice in introducing it. So what I will do is I'll invite um, Dr. Patty Labocan benson of Native Counseling Services of Alberta to the stage to, uh, to introduce the, the film for us. Good afternoon. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Patty Labocan benson I am a Métis Ukrainian. I grew up on Treaty 6 territory in St. Paul, Alberta. I want to acknowledge we're on Treaty 6 territory today and that we're all treaty people. Um, thank you for staying. This is the worst time in the afternoon, 3 o'clock. Like, how many people feel like you need a cookie or a brownie or, yeah, me. Anyway, it's a hard time of the day. So I just, um, I'm really, I feel very honored to be here to talk about the video that we produce at Native Counseling Services of Alberta. I'm the director of the video production in our organization and we've been producing videos for 40 years. Uh, most of our videos are legal education in nature. If you have ever been on our website and watched any of our videos, um, fun fact, we started producing uh, carousels of slideshows. Those are the first productions we did, so that's how long we've been around. There's some people here whose eyes are glazed. I don't even know what that is. Google it. Okay, so this video, the Hidden Homeless documentary, was part of the Edmonton Community Foundation's Vital Signs Initiative with the City uh, of Edmonton Social Planning Council. And the film was the result of a two-year project to explore issues surrounding provisional accommodation, so what other people would call couch surfing, for Indigenous people in Edmonton. Um, we, first of all, would like to thank our funders of the project, um, the Edmonton Community Foundation, the City of Edmonton, United Way Capital Region, and Stollery Charitable Foundation. So we were very lucky to be supported by these organizations. And most importantly, we want to acknowledge the nine Indigenous people and their families who struggle with hidden homelessness, who so graciously shared their stories with us on this video. And without them, we could not have done it. So. Um, we, at the end of the video, there are 50 copies of the DVDs for free if you want to take them. It's also online, streaming online, on NCSA, Native Counseling Services of Alberta, our YouTube channel. So if you go there for this video, you'll see Home Fire, if any of you have seen that video. It's uh, free for streaming. All of our videos are free. So maybe it'll be a portal into like a weekend of watching NCSA video. Who knows, right? So after the video, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to field them. Thanks. Hi, my girl. <laughs> Hi, Flutie. How's your day? That's good. So this is my niece's room. She shares it with me. That's Emma's side, and this is well, my side, kind of. But we share this dresser. Right now, I've been here about four weeks, and um, I recently got out of a treatment center, and I struggle with addictions. There's six people. There's me and baby in this room, and then there's my sister and Emma in that room, and then there's Darren and Jeff in that room. She said I can stay here as long as I want to till I get back on my feet. I never liked that word, like homeless, like, oh, it's so ugly. I don't know, I guess I kind of am in a way. Research estimates that for every one homeless person on the street, there are three hidden homeless. I figured out four times in my life I've been homeless. Once with my biological mother, once when I aged out, once when I came back pregnant with Jordan, and then when my marriage fell apart was my last time. My first degree is in child and youth care, and then my next degree is education, sleeping on an air mattress, and I was teaching out on a reserve. The hidden homeless can be found couch surfing with family, friends, and often strangers. They can also be found filling hospital beds, fleeing domestic violence in motel rooms, attending treatment programs, or serving a jail sentence. 
I got pregnant. And my mom kept kicking me out, kicking me out, and I had no place to live. My, I was just lost and alone, walking with all my bags, and I was just like, I was just broken inside, like, holy crap. I was just like, what am I fucking gonna do, you know? Off the street and out of the public eye, there's an entire community of homeless people in Edmonton who are invisible. Maybe there's problems of finances, there's problems of, you know, a dysfunction of some kind. They have no place to turn. The indigenous population in Edmonton is growing faster all the time. As more people migrate to large centers, the pressure to house them increases. Recent studies show that indigenous people are nine times more likely to be homeless than the rest of Edmonton's population. Well, my common-law and my daughter, we, we left the reserve. Um, we had nowhere to go. We bounced from like home to home in Edmonton for three months, and it was in the wintertime. There was a lot of times when there'd be alcohol and drug use. Um, I don't know, it was, just, it was rough. I didn't like it. I, at night, I used to just lay there with my baby and on the floor and hold her and cry. I'm on day pro right now. Um, I'm working for my full pro. I was, uh, I was in a few foster homes in Vancouver um, because of uh, abuse. They come from these dysfunctional situations where mom isn't a mom and a dad isn't a dad, or they come from a single mom family, and they really have nothing to turn to. So I always rebelled, you know, and that led me to the, my negative peers out drinking, uh, drugging, stealing cars, getting into trouble, right? So that led me into my crime cycle, my drug cycle, uh, the jail system. My grandparents were residential kids. They grew up in residential schools and um, the inter intergeneration trauma and stuff, it just passed on to us. And you know, that's all we seen was alcohol and violence growing up. And after a while, you know, it didn't scare me anymore. It was just natural. It was like, oh, whatever. The intergenerational impacts of colonization have created a generation of young people who probably have not experienced being loved and cared for. Sometimes have lived in very overcrowded situations their entire life. They're one of the herd in a very large ecosystem. Living on somebody's couch is absolutely no different than the experience that they've had their entire life. And maybe their mom has had, maybe their grandmother has had. As the problems from intergenerational trauma mount at home, Many Indigenous people decide to leave their communities for the opportunities and support they hope will be available in Edmonton. However, the trauma often stays with them, and only the location has changed. We all understand the economic issues that face First Nations and Métis settlements. The jobs aren't there. The economic development doesn't exist. On reserve or on settlement, people don't talk about homelessness. It exists. There's couch surfing everywhere. So when they move to Edmonton, they latch onto maybe people that they know. Stay for one night, one night turns into two, two nights turns into a week. And, you know, youth particularly can, they can stay at different place, people's houses, and those houses don't even know how transient they are. I think couch surfing has put our youth to a place where they're so vulnerable. Because I remember talking with a lot of the youth and they'd tell me, I'm staying at this complete stranger's home. I don't know how it's going to be there from night to night, or I could be at a different person's house. And I don't know how the people are gonna be in that house, if they're gonna be drinking or using or have expectations of me. The lack of health and support services on reserve or Métis settlement causes many people to choose to move to Edmonton. 
This is particularly true when it comes to mental illness. We were living in Fishing Lake. Jean-Paul was actually doing some yard work for my cousin. As we were talking, red flags started going up, and I was like, oh dear, I think my son is schizophrenic. So he constantly hears the voices. I moved to Edmonton because there was nothing in the area to help him. After he moved out of my home, he moved actually in with his dad for a while. And then his dad got sick and um, was allowing Jean-Paul to stay in his apartment. And Jean-Paul wasn't stable enough to stay in a home by himself, so he would do things like put chicken on to fry and go lay down and go to sleep. Or he'd have a bunch of people over and that would cause problems with, for the apartment. So he ended up getting evicted. Becoming homeless for personal safety can be a necessity for some Indigenous women as they flee domestic violence. Why am I in a hotel is because I'm fleeing domestic relationship over a year now. 21 days is what you're given to be placed in a woman's shelter. Um, within those days, if you cannot find a residence to reside in, um, then you are placed in a hotel. I mean, you know, like I'm here by myself from a small community, moving into a hotel that is uh, pretty much run down, no kitchen, Homelessness has many teeth, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's a predator, and it can rip and tear and really hurts people. It comes in many variable sizes and shapes, but it all has that sort of aspect of just not knowing how long that place is going to last. I was always living in my bag at every foster home that I've been in. I've never really unpacked my bags. They were always packed and I was just digging through them and I knew it wasn't going to last. I don't have any pictures of like of me or my kids on the walls. I don't have um I don't have any decorations. <laughs> I don't even have my own dresser. Like my niece like my suitcase is in the basement with my clothes in it. Like I'm still living out of my suitcase. The same suitcase I took with me to treatment. So for the longest time, um, I didn't have a mirror in my room because I didn't like looking looking at myself. I didn't like who I was. Is uh, a six by nine cell what I really wanted in my life? Or did I want my family back, my freedom, a sense of who I am? I wouldn't eat and starve. I knew they didn't have any money. And they were sweet people, they were kind, they would feed me, but it felt like a beggar. I'm going to go out. I'm going to walk around Edmonton. I'm going to find a job. I'm going to find a place to live. I'm going to dream. Dreaming about having my own home, having my own space, breaking the cycle of poverty. At summertime, I'd go out late at night and go longboarding all around the city. Eventually, I got to the point where instead of having a place to sleep at, I would stay up all night so many times in a row that I got to the point where my legs got wobbly and I could barely walk. My sister asked me if I ever sleep. She said I'm like the Energizer Bunny that runs on empty because <laughs> I would like, I'd be up at five o'clock in the morning and just have like that moment that, you know, that time to myself before I start my day. Usually like around seven o'clock, wake up the kids and then walk them to school, and then I go to my program, and I try to fit everywhere where there's a slot, or like even just a minute, it's like, who can I spend 20 minutes with, you know? I barely come home for supper, and I always come home like around 10, 10, 30. Felt like, like an alien in somebody else's home. You don't feel complete. You don't feel grounded. You don't have roots. I'd go on the bus and drive all around the city, and get off in Mill Woods and then walk all the way downtown just to kill time. The power imbalance, and it's not malicious all the time, but uh, the people who own the house have all the power. The person who is there provisionally has no power. It's very difficult to uh, self-determine or to raise concerns about safety or what have you 
when you have no power. There are times that I called my sister and I wasn't okay to come here because she was protecting her kids because I wasn't sober and doing things that I need to do to get my life on track. Well, she knows I don't talk to her when she's not sober or clean. Like when she's using or something, I, I won't talk to her. I'll just keep my distance. I won't even answer her phone calls. You know, if you don't understand the expectations of that home and aren't able to meet them, or the finances of the home are stressed and can no longer take on another mouth to feed, um, I think there's huge vulnerability attached to it. It is a step away from the street. We ended up in the hospital that time, and when he came out, he went to stay with his sister, who was very close to his age as well. And that didn't, didn't work that well because she didn't know how to cope with some of his um, behaviors, and he would bring people home, and then it wasn't a safe environment for her. So another friend tried to, well, here, I, I know somebody, let's stay together here at their place. But every kind of situation didn't work out that long, and so it just was a vicious cycle. Eventually, options with family usually run out, and the situation gets more desperate, and the options fewer and more risky. I couldn't sleep because, like, everybody was drinking in the living room, you know, there was fighting going on in the living room. It's always in the back of your head, like, you're, you're thinking, holy shit, what if, like, I'm sleeping and, and uh, you know, somebody just freaking all of a sudden just throws himself on me, you know, what am I going to do? So you can't sleep, but you can sleep, like, you're half asleep, so you don't get the rest that you need because you're always listening and waiting for something to happen. It's exhausting and tiring and it just wears you down. Couch surfing and those really underhoused and really vulnerable or um, living in really short-term situations and um, really compromised situations are um, exposed to circumstances that ultimately are eroding them, eroding their their ability, their self-worth, their ability to even access resources. If you're couch surfing, you still don't have an address. You still can't access resources others have. You get this message that you're not worth it. You get this message that you're lower than everyone else. In addition to suffering from the impacts of intergenerational trauma, Indigenous people also face widespread poverty and racism that is built into the structure of Canadian society and government systems. These realities often cut to the core of an individual's self-esteem and identity. There was times that I, w I felt uh, ashamed to be a native. Um, I grew up in, uh, in uh, a white society uh, most of my life. Um, sometimes I felt like I didn't belong with them, and sometimes I felt like I didn't belong with the natives, my own people. I wanted to be white like everybody else, uh, you know. Maybe if I dyed my hair blonde, you know, I would fit in with the, with the white kids. You know, I, I didn't like myself. I, I, um, I was racist against myself. For example, I'm many times a, a reference uh, renter's reference for, for many young people and families and you get on the phone with these these some of these landlords and they'll say well you know I'm looking at the last name and then they kind of whisper it like they don't want anybody hearing but but are they Aboriginal <laughs> you know it's like you know and that's a that's a factor that's a factor that somebody like me a, a middle-aged white male can come knocking up to any rental company and and I I'll get a different reaction than somebody that's identical to me except the color of their skin. Some are racist, judgmental. They don't give you a chance. Um, so the lady just looked at me like, you know, um, a disgusting look, or, you know, rolled her eyes and made a face. and. We a dirty Indian. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't know. <clears throat> she just, we didn't fill out an application. She just said no. There's so many barriers right now that I'm trying to chop down. I feel that the support system in 
helping me do that is is very uh, limited, especially with um, the conditions and where you're residing. I was so lost. I was no place to live, no place to go, broke. I even asked if like social services can help me out and stuff, and they said no, they can't. I told them I had no place to live, and I was you know pregnant. And they're like, well, I'm um, sorry, we can't help you. You're out of our jurisdiction. And then we see what's going on with the missing and murdered Indigenous women across Canada. There's two forms of oppression that collide. There's the misogyny of the Western society, and then there's colonization and colonial assumptions. And it seems like Indigenous women get the full brunt of both of those things. There's a lot of um, blaming the victim. The hidden homeless often spend their time languishing within government systems such as income support. The fact that they are currently sheltered is a short-term benefit that often prevents them from accessing housing programs and mental health services offered to the homeless on the street. Housing workers, they'll give you papers to fill out, but, or else they'll redirect you to other agencies that will redirect you to other agencies. And it's like, there's not really a housing agency that knows exactly what to do from the ones that I dealt with. They give me they pay, like paperwork to fill out, but then it's like, oh, well, this one's a really long list. This one's a really long list. Like, I'm just burning out trying to keep busy. And it's like, I, I'm supposed to be filling out papers and this and that and everything. But then it's like, I don't even think I fit half of the criteria because I'm technically not homeless because I don't, I don't live on the street. I live with my sister. You know, it's not surprising to me that so many workers within government become so jaded. They are constantly having to say no, or they're constantly, you know, and, and how do we support the entire system so that actually we don't have hurt people trying to help hurt people? And I think in general, it's kind of everybody's burnt. They're burnt out. They're tired. Everything is work. You're another intake or you're another... <laughs> You're, you're another person that stayed there for a moment in time, and, but you're gone again. They don't get the compassion. Working with a mom with six children, she and her six children had to be put up in a motel for nine months because you just can't find a place for six children. And they had to put them into two motel rooms. It was $8,800 a month they were spending on this family of six. And the reason, part of the reason they spent so long in this motel is the workers wouldn't give them any bus tickets to go look for a place because they were spending so much money. For what? For a lot of misery and confusion. It's like the hands of the drowning trying to save the hands of the drowning. It's just this big flailing mess. We just can't cut through all of that fog and get to the issue, which is there's not enough resources. We don't have enough, but I would say even more than not having enough. Services have really lagged in terms of the kind of support we're talking about right now. You know, understanding trauma, intergenerational trauma, really very little understanding. I'm tired of hearing the word reconciliation because nobody understands it. You can't put Band-Aids on a situation and not deal with it. There's consequences to pay. The old people tell us that. Take the hardest route. We look at the immediate cost, you know, and we don't look at that in terms of an investment. We don't look at all these hidden costs for letting the problems go on or, or the potential cost to the next generation. Instead of looking at it in terms of investment in this family, investing in a community, investing in a nation, the answer to that issue, the most economic way to deal with it is provide supports for the family. If housing is the issue, provide housing. If mental health is the issue, help parents get the support that they need. But then they come up against the yeah buts. Yeah, but we can't give people housing because then where's my housing? That's not fair. If you're going to give it to them, how come I have to pay for my own? We know better. We, we have research. We have lived experience. We know what we need to do. We're afraid to do it. We're afraid to support families in meaningful ways because we label those families as lazy, as broken. We label them as abusing the system. Sometimes it's like a high-pitched stress 
people to know, right? And I and getting to Albertans so that they understand how broken things are and how possible and how we could do something so differently and really save money. I don't think we as Albertans or we as Canadians really want to put the work into the situation to the degree that it needs to. So when things do happen, you see the results of that hard work. That's what reconciliation is. It's long-term thinking for long-term healing. The only reconciliation most people are interested in is everybody else change. The moment that reconciliation means I have to change or I have to sacrifice, all of a sudden we get a lot of defensiveness, a lot of resistance. And that's why we're very comfortable dealing with the immediate crises and the symptom of the problem. But dealing with the root causes of the problem is really difficult because the root causes means every single Canadian gets to look at ourselves. And how are we participating in that? You know, not necessarily consciously or maliciously, but how is this all set up? that we have some people who cannot do anything about their circumstance. And what happens is we wind up spending a heck of a lot more in apprehension and incarceration than we would have if we would have just housed a family. Home. That's all awful thought it was a home. Maybe stand up and face so everybody can hear you before the mic comes, okay? Yeah, look behind you, see? <laughs> I find this one really interesting where I keep hearing this not enough resources, not enough resources, not enough funding. We live in the, one of the richest cities in Canada. We got <laughs> skyscrapers going up. We got Rexall or Rogers Place going up. We got all these things going on. Yet we don't have enough resources. We got the tar sands and the oil production trying to push, push pipelines. Yet we don't have enough resources. We got the boreal forests and we, yet we don't have enough resources. We got all these companies coming in and putting their stamp on indigenous territories, yet we don't have enough resources to take care of our own. And so many people are afraid to say something and speak up because they're afraid of losing their jobs. When is it going to end? We got we to gotta address the real issue, which is colonization and corporate power and greed and, and all of that. It's like I said before, give the land back to the indigenous people and we'll show you what can be done. I think there was a, in the back, or did anybody else? Yeah, right there. I just hope I make sense what I'm gonna say. Um, thank you very much. Um, my job is seeing people every day, you know, asking for housing. And uh, being in this uh, role uh, for 25 years, you know, I see an evolution and many studies and many studies, right? But we don't, sometimes I, I think, okay, how many studies are we going to do to actually respond to the need of, you know, that, that we're seeing every day, right? So I, when I see the video, I, I think of 
that as an individuals, as a citizens, we do have to take also ownership and being active participants when the laws are coming. And I know that is tiring, but to me is mm -hmm. our work and the way that we live our lives, we have to align them mm -hmm. because the decisions that we make in our private life, they also affect the lives of the people that we serve every day. Yep. You know, so, so I invite that, I think, you know, and, and even when we're doing, I mean, the research, I mean, I, I applaud people that want to study and evaluate but we have to live those lives side by side. We cannot be blind to one because it affects us, the decisions that we make and how, you know, what answers are we given to these people and also put lots of pressure on the frontline workers too as well because we have to follow all these guidelines, uh, you know, trying to respond to needs, right? That sometimes we don't even know if they're uh, affecting others. Thank you. Thank you. There's no pressure. You don't have to say something. There is, um, if you want the DVDs, like I said, they're out in the front. It's also online, free of charge for anybody who wants to watch. And um, the idea about this was to raise awareness for sure and to start a dialogue. So I hope in your lives you can use this video just to start a dialogue about what's going on and what the lived experience of some people in our city are who are really for the most part hidden. If you're not working in this area, you don't know about this happening. Thank you for your time.